2021 is in the books and I've spent the past 12 months listening to 160 albums. Yes, 160 albums because I have nothing better to do. So let my torture help you. Today we're going to talk about the 25 best albums of 2021. Let's get it. Some of y'all know me, but you never know me from YouTube, so we're going to do something new here. For those new to the game, listen up. I have been a music critic for almost a decade now, maybe over a decade, writing about album reviews, writing about album rankings, taking time to look at some cool music and movies. We've done everything from podcasts to essays, being on Medium, Instagram, Facebook. I've done it all, but the one thing your boy has not done is invaded YouTube. And everyone keeps saying me, telling me, player, when are you going to get on YouTube? We want to see some YouTube love. That's what this is right now, our introductory video into the soul and stereo sessions here on YouTube. This is going to be fun, but because I know how YouTube works, First, I got to get all of the logistics out of the way. So if you're watching this video right now, you better hit like, you better hit subscribe, and you better share it. I know you're like, should I share it? I haven't even heard the video yet. Is it dope? Yeah, it's dope. Trust me, it's dope. And we're going to get into that in just a second. So let's get it. The 25 best albums of 2021. If you follow me on soulandstereo.com, you already know I have a list of the 50 best albums. But because this is the first video here on YouTube, I'm not trying to run y'all off with some hour long video. Let's do the best of the best. Let's do 25. So right now we're going to start with the 25 best of the year. To see the full list, go to soulandstereo.com. I've got all of them. I've got maybe 15 or so honorable mentions. If some people that you missed here, they're probably on that list. If they're not on that list, they probably whack and don't deserve to be on any list. But let's get to it. Number 25, who we got? So coming in at number 25 is Yubba and Dawn. Listen, I know a lot of my followers are R&B diehards. I know y'all are some R&B true believers. And when Yelba comes on, the first question you ask, is she R&B? What is she? Tell me what genre is it she is so I can know whether they hate her or not. Listen, we're not getting into all that. We're getting into the music is dope. And Yelba, when it comes down to it, one of my favorite voices of 2021. Absolutely beautiful. And Dawn just accentuates that. Here in this album, you're going to get a little bit more than kind of traditional R&B. Maybe you can call it alternative, but she bounces between R&B. Some of it hits a little harder. Some of it's hip-hop influence. Maybe some gospel in there. Maybe a slight dash of folk. But what you get in that bright, just almost gumbo of sonic sound is this pureness that she brings with her vocals and this album. It's a very easy, quick listen. In my opinion, one of the most underrated of them. Coming in at number 24 is my man Gallant with the Neptune EP. I'm a big believer in Gallant. A few years ago, I did a post ranking some of the best vocalists in R&B. And I remember he was pretty high on the list. And a lot of y'all were like, Harpo, who this? Who this Harpo? I don't know this man. And again, I said, stay tuned because you're missing out. And again, he has proved his worth. And I love this EP. His last album, I thought was just okay. But this one gets him back on track with the creativity that I like to see. From his generation, he's bringing a lot of, I don't want to call an old school mentality because he is great about taking the lessons of the past and is situating into his current music. You have an EP that sounds very fresh, very inventive, doesn't really sound like a throwback like some of the others will get to on the list. Definitely one for your collection. Number 
number 23, my man Conway Lama Lama Kina Lama Lama Kina. It's machine in Spanish, player. I don't know. All I know is the album is dope. If you are a fan of Griselda, y'all already know. They're the hardest working brothers in hip hop right now. They absolutely kill it each and every time out. They release 84 albums a year. And this one from Conway, probably his best work this year. Again, you know what you get with Conway. Just those hard, hard lyrics, but expertly crafted songs as well. These aren't just bars without meaning. There's purpose behind each one. And his intention and his flow is just incredible. One thing that so much of modern hip-hop is missing is intention and inflection. Hip-hop too, if you want to be real. So I'm glad that he's putting that in, that, in his music. It's aggressive. But it's not, it doesn't take you out of the experience. Easily one of hip hop's best issues. At number 22, we get into the OGs. AZ, Do or Die 2. One of my favorite albums of all time was AZ's 1995 Do or Die 1. A five star in my opinion. So... You know how I feel about sequel albums, y'all. The Soul and Stereo Faithful know how I feel about sequel albums. I feel like it's an uphill battle. You're trying to replicate something that, unfortunately, look, we can't take it back to 95. I don't know if we can get that spirit again. So you put an unfair expectation on yourself when you're like, this album is going to be as dope as the one before. Everybody can't be Terminator 2. I'm sorry. Some sequels just don't pop. But in this case, the sequel does. Although it's just kind of a sequel in name only, what really works here is that AZ does what AZ does. Just incredible lyricism and some great production too. Some of AZ's kind of criticism in the past is the production can be hit or miss. Not this time. He really has it all pulled together. A successor worthy of the door. Now. Number 21, we've got Ransom and Big Ghost. My boy Big Ghost, Heavy is the Head. Now, some of you might not be familiar with these guys, so let me give you a quick introduction. Ransom, first of all, is one of the best MCs in the game right now. Absolutely incredible with every release. Does not miss on the bars. And my man Big Ghost, if you are a fan of, of blogs and and hip-hop Twitter in the early 2010s. You know Big Ghost. Shout out to the hands of Zeus, one of my favorite writers of all time. He has really influenced a lot of the material that has come out of soulandstereo.com over the years. He's kind of kind of put down the pen, but he has gotten more into the production game in the recent years, and he really works magic with these artists. He had an EP that's on the full top 50 list. Go check that out with Conway. That was great. This one is even better. Heavy as the Head is almost like Game of Thrones hip hop style. It's a very regal sounding effort, but it also has that hard hitting grittiness that only Ransom can bring. Bars all over the place, and it's a short EP, so it's not something that's gonna take a lot of time, but he makes every moment of that EP matter. It might be short, but man, it packs a punch. <laughs> And the number 20 pick, our boy DMX with Exodus. Listen, I'm a huge DMX fan over the years. One of my favorite artists of all time. If you go into my office at work, you will see a gigantic artwork portrait of DMX. That's how much I love him. But I have to continue to be the unbiased music reviewer that you know me to be. And if I say that, I have to be honest. I love lots of DMX albums. Actually, his debut and maybe a couple others. But most of his albums don't really work because they're so uneven. There's something that's always missing, especially over the years. He just kind of lost some of his cohesiveness, which each release. However, this one regains the cohesiveness. Yes, I know some people were a little disappointed. I think that after he passed earlier this year, people were going back reliving the greatest hits. And by no means is this as good as his greatest hits. But hey, I mean, he's been through a lot, but the bars are there. The songs are well written. Some of them tug at the heartstrings like none other. Listen to Call Your Father and try to hold those tears in. If you do, you have no soul because that one hits hard. DMX is not 
the greatest DMX album of all time by any means, but it just shows that what you can do with a legendary artist who is able to recapture the magic, have some focus. That's probably a lot of that goes to Swiss Beats, who was able to do that. Focus him, give him some intention and some great storytelling. If we have to lose DMX, it still hurts my heart that Earl is no longer with us. This is the way to go out. Rolling into number 19, my man Boldy James teaming with the alchemist Bo Jackson. Look, Boldy, I know, is kind of, I would say, kind of an acquired taste. And even for me, it took me a while to get used to his delivery. He kind of has like this I don't know, methodical delivery. I think that's the best way you can say it, kind of intentional. I don't want to say mechanical because that sounds too negative, but he's he doesn't have the flashiest of flows, but what he has is just that intention. And one thing that's missing from me from some of his projects has been the production. His work here with Alchemist really sets him on the right path because you have an expert beat maker who can lay these sonic soundscapes for him that can be his playground. Boldy just does what Boldy does, and that just is drop dope lyrics. Pair that with some great beats, you have an album that cannot miss. Coming in at number 18, my man Vince Staples, an album just called Vince Staples too. I mean, look, this one seems very minimalistic. I mean, and it is. Look at the album cover. It's just like his face like this. So, Look, you're not going to get a lot of flash here. His last album, FM, really felt like, you know, the old school, remembering the radio, radio stations, and it kind of felt like that a little. This is Kenny Beats. Shout out to Kenny Beats for the production here. A lot of the songs are just a couple minutes long, and while outside of each other as singles, they're just okay, collectively, I think they work very well in execution. A lot of times I preach about albums feeling cohesive together in one, this is a project that really works as the sum of its total. When it's together, it works very well. We all know how great Vince is. He's almost like a natural when it comes to spitting. And this is proof of that. What it is is very, very brief, very short, very limited, very minimalistic. But there's a lot of substance here. It proves that it's going to take a lot to make a hit. <laughs> Number 17, Jam and Lewis, Volume 1. One of the surprises of 2021 is when Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Lewis decided, we're going to raid our vault, and we're going to kind of break out some of these old tracks that we produce for Legends that you haven't heard, you probably should have. We're going to get all of these, and we're going to deliver it to you, gift wrap, and man, is it a banger. If you miss songs from Mariah Carey, Boyz II Men, Usher, Tony Braxton, Heather Headley, all of these top list R&B acts who have worked with these legendary producers, these songs haven't seen the light of day. Some may have been bonus tracks here and there, but having these songs all together at one, it is an incredible time capsule. And because you have such a legendary production team behind them, these things don't miss, y'all. They don't miss. Some of the best songs of the year in the, ter in the world of R&B are right from this project right here. This one, if you're a fan of 90s, 2000s R&B, you better have this one on your list. In at number 16 is After 7, Unfinished Business. I know some of y'all like, After 7 is still putting out albums? Yes, you're late. And every album has, that they put out, even from their 90s heyday, still a banger. This is no exception. In some ways, speaking of the 90s, this kind of feels like it was plucked from 1999. And I know some people will be revolted by that fact. But since 1999, R&B was incredible. Your boy is loving it. Unfinished Business is great because it's just what they do best. Listen to the songwriting. I get so frustrated, y'all, listening to the songwriting of 2021. It just sounds like y'all just plucked a bunch of lyrics and memes from Instagram, slapped it up there, and put old slow, sad 
vibe a beat behind it. No, these are well-written songs that tell stories. And guess what? These are brothers singing about love. They're happy to be in love. What is this? People are happy to be in love in 2021. My mind is blown. But this is what we need. We need more of a depiction of love in our music. It's just not all fury, hate, cheating, and DM drama. This shows both sides. There's a maturity to their love stories. And that's what Unfinished Business works so well. The title is perfect because this is a group that has gone through a lot of trials, some losses, some group reshufflings. But again, they continue to rebound. And this is one of the better albums in their catalog. Number 15 is D Smoke War and Wonders. This album, my man D Smoke, this album may be one of the surprises on the list. A lot of y'all might be like, I haven't heard this one yet. That's on you. That's not on D Smoke. Last year, his album was also ranked very, very, very high on my year end list. And this dude is incredible. He doesn't get enough credit for taking the he marries his lyrical ability with storytelling. A lot of times in modern hip hop, we see one or the other. Someone who's a great storyteller, but doesn't really drag the audience into the story. We hear you, but we don't feel you. Likewise, you got folks who can't tell a story to save their life. But D Smoke is able to do both, and he's able to do it in a way where he really pulls you into his experiences on the West Coast. That continues with this album. While it wasn't as strong as last year's offering, it's still very powerful, speaking to his experience, speaking to the Black experience, and doing it in a way that's artful and engaging. Number 14 on the list is Adele with 30. Look, I know that most album of the year lists have this thing and probably like number one, number two, and rightfully so. I mean, by the time you see this video, I'm sure it would have sold 60 billion copies. It's the most streamed album in the history of streams. I know how we do with Adele and a lot of the hate that y'all give her, chill out because her credit, give her her flowers, the credit is due for her. This album is very strong. While I didn't love it as much as some, I didn't think it was good as her previous one. Absolutely, it deserved your attention and love today. Why? Because she looks at relationship drama through a lens of totality. This isn't just being mad that she got dumped. And there's some of that there. But she talks about how this new world without her relationship, how does it affect her child? How does it affect how she approaches her craft? How does it affect her business sense? How does it affect her home life? How does she move on? She's able to tell these stories through these individual songs in a way that is able to just get beyond the usual, he cheated, I want to kill him. That's cool, but a whole outlet gets dull. Being able to tell different facets of heartbreak is what the foundation of some of the best heartbreak albums of all time are based on. Adele may soon be in that category years from now. Could it be a classic in the making? I don't know. Y'all throw that around that word a little bit too much for my liking. But when it comes to heartbreak albums, by far, this is the best one of the year. I'm sorry, Summer Walker. Number 13 is Mock Hami Pray for Haiti. Here's another artist who probably wasn't on people's radar until this year, but boy did that brother get on the radar this year. He started out as kind of a Griselda kind of associate, he had a falling out with my man, my man West Side Gun. They got back together, they're cool now. But regardless, this is an album that stands on its own. He's not in anybody's shadow. But what makes Mock so impressive is my goodness. I mean, when it comes to the random ad libs, to the bars, the dark, heavy production, this is what I want from my hip hop. I want some grittiness. I want some 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 bars that's gonna make me turn my head. Those neck breakers, y'all know those neck breakers. When you hear those things, what? Those neck breaking bars are all over this thing, and I love that he's able to command every beat he's on. Never a time where he has a guest. It gets a shadow or a time where he gets lost in the production. 
he stands out with every production. Every time he's there, he's just able to project himself. I think I compared it on Soul and Stereo to, to Snoop from the Wire. Like he's just, those bars are razor sharp. You know, Snoop from the Wire had the nail gun. Those bars remind me of that. Just ba da da Just like, ah, stapling people into the buildings. You got to watch the wire. Trust me, that, that allegory is tight. Number 12 is Cleo Soul Mother. Now, some people might know her from the group Salt, but what Cleo really kind of captures with this album it's the old days. This album is called Mother and it is quite maternal in its depiction of family and life. And what it reminds me of, and shout out to my 80s babies who know this, but you remember those days when your mom would turn on that music, mother or grandmother, it's grandmother in this case for me, they would turn on that music, that cleaning music. You would just know it on Saturdays. You hear that music. Oh, so you, here comes the Lemon Pledge. This album smells like Lemon Pledge, y'all. This is the album that gives you that feeling of home and family and Saturdays cleaning up and people getting together and smelling the bacon in the room, in the kitchen. This is an album that just really feels like the togetherness of a family. And she is able to convey that through stories about her child and the jazziness of the production. They are not bangers on bangers on bangers on this one. So if you're looking for that, wrong album. But if you want an album that's really sultry, really soulful, one that's gonna hit you in those feels, check out Cleo. <laughs> We're closing in on the top 10 before we get there. Number 11, my man, Benny the Butcher, the Plugs I Met 2. Plugs I Met 1 was one of my favorites of the year when it came out. And as always, again, I told y'all about those sequel albums. They give me hives. I don't know. You said the expectation is too high. I don't know if this one's as good as that one, but it's very good indeed. Great production. Again, Benny is able to kind of get focused and get everything tied in thanks to his teamwork with Harry Fraud. Production is tight. Some great guests. Shout out to 2 Chains. That's one of my favorite songs of the year where they collab. And again, Benny Biss Benny. He's another one of those Griselda artists where you know exactly what to expect on every track. And that's what we love. I don't want to hear any vibes. I don't want to hear any trap foolishness. I just want some gritty hardness. That's what we get. And Benny never disappoints. <laughs> Top 10 time, top 10 time. And coming in at number 10 is Little Sims. Sometimes I might be introvert. Her album, her last album, Gray Area, was one of those ones that really caught my attention. Because in a world where, listen, we see all the time on social media, y'all threw poor Jermaine Dupri under the bus. I got the point he was making about female artists all sounding the same and all having the same content. And a lot of y'all yell, oh, well, what about Rhapsody? And what about this person? What about Little Sims? Because she was here doing it as well. It's content that goes beyond the norm. And Cardi and them can do what they want. That's fine. But she's speaking to her personal experiences. I love that this album is able to encapsulate both of what she's saying. Because listen, she says, sometimes I might be introvert. So there's a side of this album that is a lot more inward looking. It's a lot of self-reflection. And then this time she's just talking that rap talk. But either way, she's able to do it in a way that's compelling and engaging to the audience. So you're getting good bars. The songs are diverse enough where it's not the same song over and over again, unlike a lot of mainstream albums this year. And able to convey something that says a little bit about her that the listener can relate to as well. Little Sims to me is an artist that in time, we'll really be able to connect with both male and female artists, uh, um, fans alike, because they will be able to see something in her. That's why this album, I think, will be so special. Number nine, J. Cole, The Off Season. Look, it's hard to be a J. Cole fan here, and I am a J. Cole fan from day one. Long before it seems like I feel like Twitter didn't discover J. Cole until like 
half of the 2010s were over and then suddenly everything was the best thing ever. No, player, we go back to the warm-up mixtape days. And being a day one fan, let's be honest, I love Cole, but a lot of the most recent content, Twitter standing aside, was not for me. It was just okay. It was very hit or miss. Oh, he rip a guest verse and he destroy a Lucy. But when the albums came to it, they were too pondering, too loose. It was not focused. The production was all over the place. Off season gets it right. This is the best J. Cole album I've heard in many years. And again, he is able to do the best of J. Cole. So he's able to talk his storytelling and be able to convey kind of those inward raps that he does so well, just conveying his personal experiences, looking inward and, and kind of laying that out for the listener. And that connects and resonates so well. Likewise, when it's time to for the bars, he's got them all day. He can talk that talk and he just has quotables all over the place. This album marries both of those together. So you finally have strong concepts and just some straight up rap day rap, marry that together. And that's all it takes. And that flashes back to the J. Cole of old that we all fell in love with before things got a little too, I don't know, wrapped up in themselves. This shows that J. Cole is one of the best of his generation. We're still waiting on that five-star classic, Cole. I know it's in you. This isn't quite it, but it's a great start. All right, coming in at number eight is Raheem Devon and Apollo Brown Love Sick. The only thing I got to tell y'all with this album is I told you so. I told you so. When this album was, when it was first announced, I was like, look, this is going to be one of the best albums of the year. You got Raheem Devon, one of the best R&B artists of his generation, and by far one of the most underrated. The man drops an album like every year. Y'all don't pay attention. I don't know why. I don't know why you're missing this heat. Go listen to those albums. But he drops a great album, always well-written, always well-sung. And you get Apollo Brown, one of the best and most underrated producers of his generation for hip-hop. And you put these two together, his soul for production, Raheem's just soulfulness in general, and man, you got a winner. And just as I predicted, this album was great. I love so many of the singles. Zaddy is my song. Incredible. If I Made Love to You, another great song. This one from front to back is just very strong, solid R&B. Yes, the production kind of harkens back to days gone by, but it doesn't feel old. It doesn't feel stodgy at all. It definitely feels like a modern release, and those two work perfectly well together. I want more. Give me more. I want more of these two together. So I can say I told you so again. Number seven, Snow Allegra, Temporary Highs in the Violet Skies. Did I get that right? Temporary Highs in the Violet Skies. I get, you can't even read the album cover, play it. The album cover looks like a gummy worm just squished together. So I guess I said it right. Listen, earlier this year, Twitter was all abuzz as Twitter tends to do. Proclaiming Snow the next Sade. And even Snow was like, look y'all, chill out. Just let her be her. Let me be me. And that works well in this album. Yes, there are hints of Sade's jazzy soulfulness here, but this is all Snow. And the reason why Snow's projects, especially her most recent work, have hit so well is because no one else is doing what she's doing to this level. You have strong writing. You have that great sultriness. And even though we're in the era of the vibes, we're here to have some substance to the vibes. This isn't just sleepy time. This ain't NyQuil music. She's able to make stuff that is absolutely sexy. Listen, you go listen to Just Like That, you gonna have you two or three COVID babies. You have been warned. She is able to make her voice, her lyrics, and her soft delivery resonate in ways that I haven't heard in a long time. Like, there's very few romantic songs out here. I mean, if you want some booty and some DMs, you I mean, you can go anywhere for that. But for sultry sexiness, Snow's got it on lock. Number seven of the year for a reason. Coming in at 
number six is Anthony Hamilton. Love is the new black. Look, uh, not that long ago, I over on soulandstereo.com ranked Anthony Hamilton's LPs from bottom to top. Go check that out. Soulandstereo.com. That's your hookup for that. But in that ranking, if I had waited just a couple months to drop this one in there, despite his 30 year career at this point, this album might have been pretty high on the list. I'm talking number two or three on the list. What a great album that really encapsulates what Anthony is all about. I know I've heard some people say, oh, he sounds a little different. His boy, look, player, we all get old. We don't sound like we did at the time. But the thing is, even though the voice might be slightly different to some ears, it's still great. It's still that trademark Southern Rass that encapsulates so much passion with each, vo each note and each vocal. Love is the New Black is the type of album that we were really missing. I talked earlier about romance and heartbreak and being able to tie both of those together and come from a place of emotion. It's not just anger. There are other emotions beside anger, y'all. Trust me. And he's able to do that so well on this release. That's why it just really hits so hard. And in a, cat in a catalog that's just stacked with great album after great album after great album, this one really, really stands out. That's why it's number six of the year and one of the best albums to date from our boy. Number five, Topaz Jones, Don't Go Telling Your Mama. I bet most of you here, you can front and be like, oh, I've heard this album. No, you haven't. You haven't heard it. You missed out. But you need to go check out on it right now. Because, again, I talked a little bit about how Cleo kind of encapsulates like the motherhood that I miss from, from childhood. The thing that I love about Black families, whether you grew up in Virginia Louisville, Birmingham, LA, there are just some constant ties that tie all black families together. There's just some things that's just universal. And that's what this album really does. It really shows where we all come together when it comes to black families. And Topaz just his narrative is so great to kind of transport you back to those days of innocence and those days of learning and discovery. That's why this album really resonates, especially in today's climate and the diversity of it. The album is so fun. It's so fun to hear not only just, you know, beats and bangers, but production is lively and it drives you into the experience. So it's one of nostalgia, but it's also one of energy and reflection and hope. This album really, really hits. And I know that while many may have not heard it, this is your chance to catch up. It's one of the best of the year. Coming in at number four, The Shindellas hits that stick like grit. I am so excited about this album. Why? Because it's like somebody was like, what's up, Ed? And I'm like, what's up, player? And they say, what is missing from R&B? And then I take out my scroll and I throw it and it rolls all the way under the, the chair. And I'm like, these 180 things are what's missing. And the Cinderella's are like, cool, we're going to add this. And then I listen to the album and I'm like, yes, you added them all. This is dope. Yes, this album is so incredible because every single asset of R&B that I've been complaining about for the past decade that has been missing, has been removed, has been pushed to the side, is present here. Shout out to my boys, Lewis York, for being able to have that creative vision to take these ladies and guide them down that path. Because what we have is harmonies. We have bridges, we have concepts, we have vocals, we have everything that encapsulates the storytelling, the emotion and passion of strong R&B all in one album. You got songs that go seven minutes, seven minutes, seven minutes is like eight songs combined on some of these albums I heard from some of y'all faves. And the album is still three hours long. How you do that? How you have a song that's two minutes, but your whole set is four hours? Somebody is doing something wrong, player. No wonder I gave your album two and a half stars. But I didn't give this one two and a half stars because the Shindellas are able to put all of the elements of strong R&B together. I mean, sometimes it's a little pointer sister. Sometimes it's a little 
supreme, sometimes it's a little brownstone, sometimes it's a little in vogue, but what it is, is a project that really puts them on the map. The Chandelas are here to stay. I can't wait to see what they knew next. And this is one of my absolute favorites of the year. Coming in at number one, two, three is Tyler, the creator. Call me if you get lost. I've been a fan of Tyler, but Tyler is one of those artists that has this gigantic following on social media. And I'm like, he's cool. He's dope. He's incredible at all the things that he does and juggles. But sometimes the projects can be hit or miss. I love Wolf. I love, I didn't love Igor. And that's kind of how it is with me. I know that'll get me canceled because I didn't love Igor. But there are albums that he puts out that are great. And there's some that are just okay. For every cherry bomb that has me kind of scratching my head, he'll put out something that's really good. To me, I think Tyler was like, I want to prove to y'all that I am an artist artist. I can be a lyricist. I can be a producer. And here is where he does it. And he wisely does that in the form of a mixtape. That's why he gets... DJ drama to give it that Gangsta Grills mixtape feel. If you one of those 2000s era hip hop fans, you know about the Gangsta Grizzles all over the track. And that's the feel that you get here. Listen to, remember what a mixtape did in the 2000s. It was able to showcase not only for new artists, but for kind of emerge for returning artists. It's almost kind of like a resume. This mixtape shows fans and labels, this is what I'm capable of doing. This is what I'm capable of bringing to the table. And I think that is the chip that Tyler had on his shoulder here. I'm going to show y'all what I can do in all forms. We're going to do this mixtape old school style and present it in a way that's going to resonate. And boy, did it ever. Because not only did it bring in kind of those lap fans like me that like Tyler, but it was getting kind of eh. But he was able to also put his arm around those day ones, those super fans who never left him in the first place. He brought us all together and not able to lose anyone in that journey. This is probably Tyler's best work to date. That's why it comes in at number three. Number two, Silk Sonic and Evening with Silk Sonic. And I knew, I knew from the day we heard about this collabo that this album would be very high on our list. Why? Because you cannot fail with this. You've got D-Mile, one of the most, if I had to name the MVP of R&B for the past year or two, it has to be D-Mile. He just has, his name is behind every strong R&B production that you have heard. Then you've got Bruno Mars. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's a showman as a vocalist. He's got it all. And you got Anderson Park, who actually is on the level of Bruno, but just doesn't have the profile to me. So you put all three of those elements together. You've got a banger. Yes, this is an album that harkens back to 70s soul, but it does it in a way that doesn't feel like, despite what the critics say, it doesn't feel like karaoke to me. This feels like a homage. This feels like an, a, a group of artists who came together and was like, we are going to take the lessons of the past and build upon that and present something that's fresh and fun and unique. And that's what this album is. It's every bit as fun as you would expect. It almost plays out as like a story. It's like these two guys who meet a girl they fall in love with the girl, they lose the girl, and then they're off to the next adventure. That plays out over this nine track album. And even though it's a pretty short one, and this is one of the few times you'll hear me say this, if it had just a couple more songs there, I probably would have bumped it up and it could have been maybe the elite five star territory, who knows? But that's just a bunch of hyperbole and just theoreticals. But what we got, is absolutely incredible. In my opinion, the best R&B album of 2021. And before we get into the top spot, the number one album of the year, don't forget, if you haven't done it already, hit like, hit subscribe, 
hit all the little button things. Listen, I'm new to this, but I know that you're supposed to hit like and subscribe because every YouTube video I watch, they tell me to do it. So make sure you do that. Help your boy out. Give your boy a share. If you like this content, we'll have more of it coming up soon. But let's get to number one of 2021. It's my man, Nas Escobar, King's Disease 2. This album is so... <laughs> I don't want to say it's the most important album of Nas's career because that would be supreme hyperbole. He is the man behind Illmatic, in my opinion, the greatest, the greatest hip hop album of all time. This week, we celebrate 20 years of Stillmatic. Again, that's a sequel album that worked very, very well. I mean, you can look back to his 2012 album, Life is Good. The last time I gave a album five stars was that album in 2012. I haven't done it since. But those with that type of resume, plus so many others, it's hard to say that this album is as good as those because it's not. But what it does is set the standard for who Nas is. So last year, we had King's Disease 1. Great album. It was able to reestablish himself with producer Hit Boy to a new generation. I mean, let's be real. There's a generation of rap fans who hadn't heard a Nas track because a lot of the fans, especially the Twitter generation, they were tuned out of Life is Good in 2012. The Nasir album from a few years ago was very divided as far as opinions. So they only knew him from that. And then his legacy from long before they were into it, this man is basically rap Santa Claus. They don't know anything about him. But when they heard him combine with an artist, a producer like Hit Boy, who was able to take his inherent skill with kind of modern production and marry those together, you knew you had a hit. And it became the first album that netted Nas his long-deserved Grammy. So now we've got the sequel. And when it comes to King's Disease 1, I was like, okay, I'm sure this will be a cash-in. It'll be a bunch of leftover tracks from the last time. Absolutely not. This album outdoes King's Disease 1 in every conceivable way. The concepts are stronger. The guests are incredible. Lauren Hill is back and the bars are bangers. And he's able to continue to tell his story of being hip hop's elder statesman, but also reminding you youngins, you can go run to the store for the OGs while we sit here and we have brunch on Sundays and talk about what we've got talking about. You'll catch it. You'll, you'll catch on, youngin. But right now, I'm not ready to give up the throne. When it comes to Hit Boy's production, the absolute masterful way that Nas can just float over these beats. And it's so funny to me when the younger fans find out that Nas can do trap. Look, if you're an MC, it don't matter. It don't matter what the beat is. If you're an elite MC at your craft, you can hop on anything. Nas can do it. It doesn't matter. When it comes to storytelling, when it comes to beats, when it comes to lyricism, production, storytelling, every beat that makes hip hop what it is, I could not find a better album in 2021 than Nas's King's Disease 2. The number one album of the year. So there it is, the top 25 albums of 2021. Listen, if you miss your favorite, don't forget you can go to soulandstereo.com. You can see the full list of 50 plus the honorable mentions. Go check that out and leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Who did you think should be included on the list? Are you mad that you didn't see her or Lloyd Banks or Jasmine Sullivan? Leave it in the comment. I didn't forget them. They just ain't on the list. Sorry. Leave a comment. I might look at it. I might not. I'll be nice. I'll look at it. This is my first video. So listen, thank you so much for joining me, for sitting here. Don't forget to hit that like. Don't forget to hit that share. And maybe there'll be more sessions to come. If y'all like right with this video, maybe we'll get it going. Thank you for joining us for the Soul and Stereo sessions here on YouTube. This session is a wrap. Play on, players.